Let's get ChatGPT to write some code for us. Well, that was colorful and easy, but does it work? Does it run? Or does it provide the right answers? We'll find out today in Dave's Garage as we learn that and a lot more about coding with ChatGPT. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today, I'm going to show you how to significantly update and improve your coding skills by incorporating ChatGPT into your daily workflow. And I believe that it's true whether you're just starting out or if you're an old gray bearded wizard. It's an important tool that you won't soon work without. I've been coding for a living since the late 1980s, having been an operating systems engineer at Microsoft on MS-DOS and every version of Windows on through XP. And despite some widespread cynicism about its accuracy and value by those who perhaps don't know how to make use of it properly, I can tell you with great certainty that what I'm going to show you today is something that every relevant coder will be doing not long from now. I believe it's the biggest inflection point in programming since the web itself. Now, programmers have been cheating on their homework since time immemorial, copying from textbooks and their friends' code listings and on to most recently finding answers to their problems on sites like Stack Overflow. With careful searching, the odds are that you'll be able to find a code snippet that does something like what you're looking for, and hopefully it's close enough to give you the inspiration that you need to then write the code on your own. With ChatGPT, we can just come straight out and ask it what we're looking for, and it will produce code. But there's a lot more to using ChatGPT effectively than that, and those are the skills that we'll learn today. But here's the thing. So far as I can tell, ChatGPT has a great deal more knowledge than intelligence. ChatGPT is a little bit like an eight-year-old hyper-smart kid that has read the whole internet. And then they sat down and read all the code on the internet, and then they thought real hard about it for a long time. But it's still an eight-year-old, slightly odd kid. And maybe like me, that kid's got some autism going on, because he or she is going to take your requests very literally. And they'll do better if you're forthright with them than if you make them assume things for you. And so it is with ChatGPT as well. To get started, let's look at some basics, no pun intended, before we get on to some of the subtleties that make using it powerful enough to be professionally practical. Like most tools, when it doesn't work right, you should blame the operator first. And so, before we can craft something really elegant, we've got to learn how to rip some particle board, as it were. So let's first solve some simple coding problems using ChatGPT. Back when I was still a bit like that slightly odd kid that I just described, my own 1541 floppy drive melted down, and so for a few months all I had was the audio cassette to save things on. As a result, I was always looking for really simple things that I could solve with my Commodore 64, and one example I remember well was sitting down and writing a conversion utility to go to and from Roman numerals. So let's see if ChatGPT is as smart as I was back then by having it do the decimal to Roman numeral conversion. Now I speak Python with a C accent at least, so I'm always curious to see how other people do things. Let's kick things off then with a Python example before moving on to the more uh, muscular languages. Our first question then will be to ask it to write a complete Python application that inputs a decimal number and displays it in Roman numerals. I'll grab the code by clicking copy code and then we'll paste it into Visual Studio Code where we can get a better look at it. First, the code declares a map of Roman numeral symbols to their values, such as M is 1000, C is 100, L is 50, and so on. And even though I'm a C++ guy, this actually demonstrates the power of Python rather nicely in how the R and num are both enumerated as you go through the map. What it does is it counts how many of the symbol's value, such as 1000 for M, can be wholly divisible in your original decimal number. It then appends that many of the symbol onto the result. Basically, by going in a greedy first fashion and taking out the largest value symbols first, what it does is it just measures how many of the symbol's values would fit into your decimal number. It then backs that many out and prints that many copies of that symbol. Down here is the main application definition. I'm not used to Python, so this whole name equals main is a little voodoo to me, but I'm presuming all it does is ask for the decimal number as an input string, converts it to int. It then passes your decimal number to the decimal to Roman function, which returns the result and is printed out on the console. Let's run the app and put it through its paces. First number I'll do is 3888 which I believe is the longest one you can get under 4,000. I'll try one, two, three, four. That looks correct. Five, four, three, two. And that is also correct if you accept the five M's in lieu of a M with a bar. 
So clearly, it's able to crank out computer science work of the high school level. But bear with me, because by the time we have it sieving memory on parallel threads on both the CPU and the GPU, I promise you that you'll be at least a little bit impressed. Before we go there, however, I should note that you're not just limited to contemporary languages. What if I ask it to write this program for the Commodore 64 using CBM Basic V2, for example? Well, its first answers were a bit sketchy, as they included read and data statements on the command line to set things up, and so I asked for it to all be programmatic instead. That makes it a bit more verbose, but also more straightforward. To test the code, I'll type it into the trusty old Commodore 64, and we'll see what we get. ChatGPT is a little rusty, and its first attempts would not work. For example, it called a variable value, which conflicts with the built-in command val. And that's the first clue of how to work with ChatGPT. When it makes a bad assumption, immediately correct it. It will usually remember the context for at least the remainder of your ChatGPT session and incorporate it into all your future results in that session. I told it a few criteria to enforce, like doing everything in lowercase, using only two-letter variable names, and that the if-then clauses had to be on a single line. It got close, but it was emitting lines longer than 80 characters, which is all basic and choked down. So then I asked it to keep the lines under 80 wide, and soon enough, everything worked perfectly. Let's have a look. Let's see if I can still type on one of these. And if ChatGPT has done its job, we can just type run and be prompted for the decimal. One, two, three, four. It's a little slower, but that is the right answer. 3888, similarly, the right answer. And so there you have it, a successful attempt by ChatGPT at writing code in languages from two completely different eras. The Retro Basic took a little more guidance to get right, but the Python ran exactly as it was produced. But it won't always be so easy, trust me. Now, I hope at least about 85% of you are now thinking, well, that's great, Dave, but I don't have to code decimal to Roman conversion very often. I write real code for a living. Well, let's move on to C++ then. We'll first replicate the Python and basic results and then move on to some more high-performance problems. We'll ask for the same thing, but this time in C++ and ask it to be compact so it all fits on the screen, ideally. And again, I'll click copy code and copy the code and paste it into Visual Studio Code where we can get a better look at it. Here we see it defines 13 strings that represent the Roman numeral symbols and the 13 values that accompany those symbols. Mapped one to one, it's pretty easy to look up one from the other using the same index. In this case, it's a little different than the Python in that it doesn't proceed from its current place in the loop until the number has exhausted the amount of times that its value can be removed for the symbol. So if the number is over 2,000, it will have to remove m twice by backing out the value 1,000 from num and adding the symbol for m to the result. And at the end, it returns the result string. I would say that the use of C++ strings here really cleans up this code relative to what it would be if you were using character buffers. And the program itself simply asks for, then reads in the decimal number before passing it to decimal to Roma and then passing the result to the output stream. In other words, printing it on the terminal. And after pressing compile, I'll simply run it from the console and we'll put in our favorite numbers, one, two, three, four. We'll remain again, 3888 for the long one. Run it again and we'll do the year 2023 and it is also correct. Let's go from high school to college by building a prime sieve. A year or two ago, we kicked off the Language Drag Racing series, which has grown to more than 80 languages with more than 100 solutions, from Ada to Zig and everything in between. At its core was the original C++ version that I'd written, and I want to see if ChatGPT can craft something close enough to be at least competitive. And so, let's try something a little more complicated, if not more realistic, and then we'll look at how to really get value out of it. Let's have it crank out a prime sieve for the first 100 million integers and see how it does there. Then I'll up the ante much further. My query for ChatGPT will be more specific this time. Write a very compact but efficient prime sieve of the numbers up to 100 million in C. Time the execution from allocation to freeing of the sieve, report the elapsed time, and the number of primes that it found. Now, just as we've done before, I'll submit the query to ChatGPT and we'll get the code that it produces. We'll take that code over to Visual Studio where it's easier to see and have a look. Now, it's not super efficient, it goes well past the square root and up to the max where it doesn't need to, and so on and so forth, but it looks essentially correct, so let's compile it, run it, and see if it produces the right results and in how much time. We'll simply run the compiled executable and see how long it took to execute based on its internal timer and if it produces the right number of results, which at 78,498 it does, and it took five one-thousandths of a second to do it. 
For comparison, we'll time the version I wrote myself before seeing that one, and we'll see how it compares for time. My version executes in about one thousandth of a second, so about five times faster than ChatGPT, and it's also following some more stringent criteria, but it's a good start for ChatGPT. Let's see how far we can take it. Well, I set it up the ante, so let's start to do that. Let's make it at least multi-threaded. And not just multi-threaded, but entirely cross-platform too, so that it doesn't rely on any system API calls to do it. My query for a sieve that would match up against the GitHub Primes project was complicated, but roughly matched the rules. It describes how the program should work, and the essentials are that it's going to compute the primes up to 1 million on all the cores as many times as it can in 5 seconds. It can only use one bit of storage per sieve element, so 1 million bits per sieve. It has to allocate and tear down the memory anew for each sieve pass, and it cannot incorporate any advanced knowledge of other prime numbers other than 1 and 2. ChatGPT wasn't able to produce a working solution right out of the box. It kept getting the stats wrong or printing the total number of primes found on all sieves rather than per sieve and so on. There were also bugs that I had to guide it to fix. It's this kind of iteration and refinement that is the key to using ChatGPT. First I'll show you the code we wound up with, and then I'll take you through the process of how I got there. Starting in the app's main section, we see that it saves away the current time so that it knows when 5 seconds are up. It then pulls the maximum number of threads from the standard library's hardware concurrency value. Then, for each of those CPU cores, it spins up a thread which runs through the run sieve call that we'll look at briefly. It then sleeps for 5 seconds to let all the background threads do their work on the sieves, until setting the stop sieving value to true, so that all the threads will then exit. T-join makes sure that all the threads are collected and have in fact completed before it proceeds. It then runs one final single sieve on its own in order to count the number of primes that are found in any one pass before producing all of the output statistics. Now up at the top of the file, the prime sieve class is declared and it's largely the same as the single threaded prime sieve that we saw in the last example, so we'll just bypass it for now. The run sieve function, which is the entry point for all of the background threads, is where the magic happens. It sets a timer, it creates a copy of the sieve, and it runs the sieve. As soon as its prime sieve instance is done, it increases the local count of sieves performed, as well as adding to the local time taken. This code will keep spinning in a loop, creating and running prime sieves, keeping track of them and their time until the stop sieving value has been set by the main function. When it has, it returns its count in total time. So in summary then, it does precisely what we want. The main function spins off one thread per core, and each of those cores spins creating and running prime sieves as fast as it can up to one million until five seconds have elapsed when they get flagged to stop. I tested and verified that the code worked, and found that on my Mac Ultra Studio it was able to perform 10,882 passes in those five seconds. Now impressive as that sounds, the hand-coded version that I did for the Primes project completed 87,000 passes in the same time. Let's have a look at some of the back and forth iteration that I had to do with ChatGPT to get it to produce a working solution that met the requirements. After all, it is this refinement and addition to and the correction of the context that is important. It's essentially how to iterate on a solution with ChatGPT as your partner in development. It will do the heavy lifting and the boring parts while you lend the learned eye towards its progress. Now before I hold this example up as some kind of proof that it can now do your day job, you might be even more clever yet. After all, what fun is just writing a prime sieve that uses a CPU? Let's invite the GPU to the party and see if ChatGPT can actually gainfully employ it. What should we ask for? Well, how about write a multi-threaded prime sieve that employs the CUDA API to make use of the GPU wherever it could be expected to improve ultimate performance, including stream compaction. Now, the gory details of CUDA programming are a little beyond the scope of what I can cover here today, so I'll breeze through the process of generating testing the code, and instead focus on the back and forth refinement of the code as we go. First, I left it fairly open-ended. I just set a multi-threaded C++ prime sieve that makes use of the CUDA API to leverage the GPU for faster sieve performance, including stream compaction. The sieve kernel is the important part where it scans for and then blocks out numbers that it finds to be prime, which it does on multiple threads on the GPU at once. Jumping down to my next iteration, I ask it straight out, is there any way to make this sieve faster? And it offers multiple solutions, such as load balancing, optimizing the block size, using shared memory, and so on. And so I'm going to ask it to recreate the sieve using some of those methods. And so I'm going to ask it for one that is segmented, adds load balancing, and segments the sieve specifically for a size of 100 million, because why not? Let's use all the memory we've got. Here we find the code again for sieving the kernel and for compacting the kernel. 
Now, I'm not much of a CUDA programmer, but I can already tell one problem here for sure. It's doing CUDA malloc to allocate memory on the GPU, and then it's touching it in the for loop from the CPU. And that's not going to work unless you're using shared memory. So that's going to be a change we're going to have to make. Next, I ask it a series of questions like what the file name extension should be. Should be .cu for a CUDA file. And in the actual state of the sieve, is it using 0 or 1 to represent inclusion or exclusion because I wasn't sure. I went around and around with this memory access issue for a while before asking it to simply do it so that the CPU makes the allocation and then hands everything off to a CUDA function that does the actual work. Next, I ask it to explain to me its stream compaction approach, and then I suggest to it another approach that it could use for CUDA device synchronize and GPU memory. And after some more iterations back and forth, I finally tell it to please use unified memory on the GPU instead. And without getting too far into the weeds of CUDA programming, we can now see that it does a CUDA malloc manage to get shared memory between the GPU and CPU. The CPU then sets up the initial state and hands it off to prime civ kernel to do the actual work before finally synchronizing the device again. Finally, I ask it to correct one problem where it's got a loop variable that's not properly declared. And from there, we get the code that it ultimately produces for us. I hope the creation of a prime sieve running accelerated on the GPU on multiple threads is enough to convince you that with the requisite amount of handholding, ChatGPT can be an essential tool in not just learning new concepts, but also in generating the fundamental framework behind whatever your project demands. Soon enough, I'll be taking a look at how to go the other direction, feeding your previously handcrafted code into ChatGPT to have it find and fix bugs and defects in your code and logic. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel so that you don't miss it. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out the free book sample on Amazon for Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's everything I know now about autism and Asperger's that I wish I'd known back then. And it's not just for people who are or believe they might be on the spectrum, but also for anyone who lives with, loves, or works with someone who might be. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.